Yeah, so hello everyone. Welcome to our first in-person seminar in this term. And today we have Eric as our speaker. So Eric is a deep student here at Mass Micro Institute, supervised by Professor Neil Lambert. Before join, joining the Mass Micro Institute, he did his master's in Rome, and he has also been working with one of the awardees of the recent Nobel Prize in physics, Professor Giorgio Parisi. Today, he will talk about the awardees' contributions that has led to these awards and also their ties with networks. So, time is yours. Let's welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. Um, as you mentioned, I will try to make a little bit sense of what the uh, award was awarded for, because I found the, um, the uh, speech quite confusing at the beginning when they uh, divided the prize into two halves, which were quite different. Um, I will talk through that, and then I will really talk about the contribution of Giorgio Parisi, because I, I admit straight away that I don't know the other two of these uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I will try to show two of the main results that he came up with, uh, both in statistical physics. One will be uh, more simple, but also more accessible, and then I will try to make sense of his solution of the SK model, which is regarded as his, probably his most uh, famous contribution. So, uh, without further ado, computer is not working anymore, okay. Um, this is a brief outline, some introduction about the prize, some statistical mechanics, it's tied to network science, conclusion and references, and also for the readings if anyone gets interested by, by this talk. So I will, try, I will start very, uh, very briefly by uh, citing the, um, what the Swedish Academy of Science told uh, last Tuesday. Uh, awarding the Nobel Prize in Physics for groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex physical systems. Um, maybe just a brief uh, word about what we consider to be complex systems. They extend to uh, a large variety of uh, applications and realities, from biology, finance, to routes, uh, optimization. Um, and um, I've always felt that this field, the field I'm working in, I'm doing network science here, which is a subset of complex systems, um, have also, uh, have always been, from some point of view, uh, pushing towards the new scientific discoveries, but also disregarded because it doesn't have um, an identity in itself. It, bo it just borrows from statistical physics, computer, uh, computer science, biology, and many, many other graph theory, of course. And so, um, yeah, I was surprised, positively surprised, that this has uh, gotten a real, um, a real recognition which uh, can be recognized all over the world. Uh, the three awardees, as I mentioned, are Sicuro Manabe, Klaus Hanselmann, and Giorgio Parisi. And they, uh, the prize has been divided as follows. Half of the prize was awarded to Manabe and Hassman jointly for modeling the Earth climate. So this is a very, if, if you want, uh, a very political also, uh, um, award uh, in terms of um, pushing towards um, um, tackling climate change and try to understand uh, the data that we are, are provided by the historic series there. And the other half was awarded to Giorgio Parisi for the discovery of interplay of disorder and fluctuation in physical system from atomic to planetary scales, which is a nice way of saying he did a little bit of everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and these, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop a little bit here because these, I believe, are truly the two faces of complex system because the first one is something that is very tailored, very tailored specifically uh, towards one problem, very close to application. Uh, and the other one is playing with some toy models to try and develop theoretical results and truly understand what's going on behind the curtains. Uh, by talking 
about the first two very briefly, I can just really say that both work on computational modeling in atmospheric physics, and they are known for uh, a climate variability model that carries handsome name, and Manabe for the pioneering of the modeling of the Earth atmosphere. I won't go into any other detail because, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not mm, the, the right person to do that. If you're interested, please write us an email for the network seminar about that. Um, I will talk about Giorgio Parisi, but I want to um, go over briefly to what he has done that is not statistical physics. He has done a lot of stuff. Um, this talk will be mainly on statistical mechanics. I'm sure some of you will be extremely upset by that, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, he also worked in high energy physics, quantum chromodynamics, condensed matter physics. So he did, um, um, he did a phase transition in liquids and, um, uh, and solids, condensed matter. Um, he developed the altarelli parisi equation together with the another Italian physic, Giulio Altarelli, and also worked um, in particle physics at the um, uh, ENFN, Instituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare, in Italy. And funnily enough, when I was going through his, uh, scholar, um, uh, his Google Scholar page, I found this really nice paper that talks about climate study, which is, of course, not as developed as uh, the work of the other two, but it's still significant. He has more than a thousand citations, so it must contain something good, right? Uh, and it's a very old paper, Stochastic Resonance in Climate Change, and I just put it in because I thought it was quite funny that he also touched that argument of the two over Ds for, for decades ago. Okay, I can now move to the part that I'm more confident talking with, uh, to. And this is statistical mechanics. This has been the core of his work that uh, extends in several areas of statistical mechanics, um, and specifically the statistical mechanics of, mag of magnetic system, as opposed to the statistical mechanics of gases and continuous system. Um, we will have a look at three models, uh, which are not ordered in any particular way. They're kind of following uh, um, mental order. Uh, we will start by the Ising model, which is the simplest of, uh, of all, and then we will evolve into spin glasses, and then we will revert back the complexity to the Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass model, which is a subset of spin glass, as you can imagine from the name, but it, it, it is also considered um, the easiest one for a reason that we will see. So let's start talking about the Ising model, which is a very standard um, physical uh, system that is usually represented on a um, on a lattice, either one, two, three, four dimensional. It doesn't really matter. The idea is that you have some atoms with a magnetic moment, and this magnetic moment can either is considered to be constant but changes direction. So it can either be on the unit sphere, and that's called the Heisenberg spin, or it can be plus or minus one. And this is normally justified by the anisotropy of the topology of the system that uh, forces the magnetic spin to point up or down. And this is particularly true in the 2D lattice. Uh, there have been extension on graph topology, but I want to stress the Ising model has been devised on lattices because it was a model for uh, magnetism. And so they will try to model how magnetic materials uh, work on a, on a microscopic level. Um, the Ising model has been uh, proposed by Ising, uh, who also solved the one-dimensional one dimensional chain uh, in 1925, I believe, and the 2D lattice is also completely analytically solved uh, by Jan Zacher in the 40s, I don't remember the, 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 the specific year. So let's try to give a definition. An Ising system is a system composed by n variables, which are either plus or minus one for the reason we've just said. Um, a set of pairwise interaction, which are supposed to be constant, um, and a Hamiltonian energy function, which is written right there. Um, the pairwise interaction can be either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, um, and this depends on the sign of the coupling constant J, 
which uh, cannot be zero. Well, it can be, but if it's zero, there's nothing up there because uh, the energy is constant to zero. And on the 2D lattice, how it works is the um, ferromagnetic ideal model um, basically uh, has just two solutions where all the spins are pointing up and another solution in which all the spins are pointing down. And the reason is if you look in these, um, in this, it's not working, in, in this sum here, whenever uh, these two spins, here there's a minus sign missing, whenever these two spins are of the same sign, this gives a negative contribution to the energy, and so the, um, the alignment is favored. And you can just, and you can really start seeing uh, what can go wrong here. If you have just a few j that are negative, and this will be the expansion to spin system, you're not really sure how to give the best possible configuration of the spins. Um, we will talk about this later, but let's just briefly talk about uh, the statistical mechanics setting. So this Ising model is always assumed to be in a thermal bath, which is the same as saying it follows the canonical and similar statistical mechanics. We call the temperature of the heat bath T and the inverse temperature beta. And everything is distributed but, uh, according to the Boltzmann distribution. Um, and the normalization constant, the, the n, is uh, basically just the, the, the sum of, the, of all the probability and is called partition function. This is truly the quantity that we want to know about the system, because if we know that, we will see in the next slide, um, we can do basically everything we want through thermodynamical relations. However, it, it, we must notice that the cardinality of this uh, the set uh, over to which the sum runs grows exponentially. And so for, even for a relatively small system, we cannot perform that calculation directly. This, this is a thing that will come bite us uh, again later on. So uh, what do we mean by solving the system? Um, in statistical physics, solving the system means uh, find out an analytical solution for the free energy. And again, the partition function is cardinal in this, in this setting, because if we know the partition function, then we, just, we can just use the, the Boltzmann formula to calculate the free energy straight away. But this is not just about the free energy, as I uh, mentioned before. Uh, if we know the partition, the partition function, everything is straightforward because we can calculate the internal energy and the entropy straight away and everything else is just um, thermodynamics from there. Uh, we are also interested in something which is called the thermodynamic limit which is the limit of large system because we remember that we started from thermodynamics we want to model magnets essentially and magnets are made up by atoms in a number that is roughly equivalent to the Avogadro number. So we, we, we're interested in, in, in that limit there. Um, but this, this uh, impossibility of knowing the, the, partition, the partition function extends to any observable. Let's take the simplest observable that we have, the average magnetization, which is simply the normalized sum of all the spins. So the average magnetization will be plus one if all the spins are pointing up, minus one if, it's, uh, if they're all pointing down, but then again, when we're trying to calculate, we need to weight it, uh, we, we need to weight the magnetization of every configuration on the Boltzmann, on the Boltzmann distribution, and we don't know that, that distribution because we don't know the, um, the, um, the partition function. So how do we go around this? Well, the standard, and I'm coming to uh, the contribution of Dr. Prezi, this is all well established, I know, but I want to lay down everything uh, as clear as possible. Um, so the idea is to use a Monte Carlo, uh, a Monte Carlo algorithm that creates a Markov chain that samples the distribution accordingly to the, um, to, to the Boltzmann weight. That way we can, uh, in, the, in the long time regime, we can swap the average on the ensemble uh, with the time average. And hopefully we get an estimate that is close enough to the uh, original average. Uh, this uh, allows us to, est to estimate the observable, and this allows us to estimate the observable fairly well uh, in terms, for example, finding out that the 
um, an ising lattice has a first order transition in terms of the magnetization. What this means is that there exists a temperature uh, in which the um, in which the, um, the, the the first derivative of the magnetization diverges, um, and this is this is calculable via standard Monte Carlo uh, estimate. Uh, but um, the, the the standard Monte Carlo has some problems, um, that uh, in particular that the temperature parameter beta needs to be very accurate because. Um, Changing it um, in either direction causes either a critical slowdown, which is exponential in the in the error that we make on the temperature parameter, or it's just it, it just plainly uh, disregard the minima that we are interested interested in, and so we, we we're not actually sampling the Boltzmann distribution where the the the, the heaviest weight are put on the on the minima, but we're just cutting everything out. And the and the um, and the estimate is far away from the from the true value. So how do we solve that? And this is where um, Giorgio Parisi published a paper in 1992, uh, proposing a modified version of the Monte, of the standard Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, together with another professor, um, Ezio Marinari, uh, who's also a professor uh, at, uh, at La Sapienza. Um, the idea here is to um, try to enlarge the state space in order to have some leeway to work around this, um, this, crit this critical slowdown. Um, the idea is, is, is the following. So we want to sample the minimum of the distribution, but the minimum of the distribution have the problem that are far away, um, they're often uncorrelated and have high barriers of energy in between. So one standard method that was already known at the time was called simulated annealing, or, or another one was parallel tempering, which basically allowed us to uh, ch dynamically change the temperature of the system in such a way that uh, when we heat up the system, we allow the system to jump over the energy barriers and then we cool it down again and we sample the correct minima. Uh, the problem with this, with this simulation, however, is that the system is driven out of equilibrium every time we change the temperature. Um, and this is, this is not good because the Monte Carlo estimate is only correct when the uh, Markov chain is, on, uh, is at equilibrium. So uh, care had to be taken where whenever using um, those kind of algorithms to try to uh, make the uh, the things work out uh, the way they're they're supposed to. Um, okay, equilibrium times. This is the paper uh, in Simoninardi and Giorgio Parisi. And how does it work? Well, it works uh, by enlarging the, the the phase space. So sigma is the is the space of all possible configuration of the spins. It's a two to the end um, uh, two to the end. Uh, it's a set of cardinality 2 to the n, which uh, is, is represented by all the binary strings of length n. And we add a dimension um, with uh, n values m, so that the new state values are sigma and mi. Um, we also define a new Hamiltonian function, um, hm, which takes into account um, the, um, the, um, the the state of the M as long uh, as well as this, uh, the state of the system, and we we just say that the corresponding distribution is uh, the Boltzmann distribution weighted on the new Hamiltonian, and the way this works here and the way the beta is missing here is that we have a new parameter beta M that here is kind of munched into the new Hamiltonian. So that, M, that Hamiltonian depends on M through beta M, which is a parameter that depends on M. Um, and the, the, the nice thing about this algorithm is that there is no strict requirement about the beta and the G, which are just parameters that we are free to choose whenever, um, however we want for now. 
there will be a certain choice that will make sense, and we're just about to see it now. So once we have that distribution, we try to um, we try to calculate the, distri the, the distribution given a fixed m. And so, so we have taken the standard phase space and we have basically duplicated, like multiplicated it along a new axis uh, governed by m. Um, each of these phase space um, has the standard uh, Boltzmann distribution, which is dependent on beta i, which is the beta corresponding to the uh, indices um, by the i. Um, so, if we fix n to be an i, uh, we have uh, right there uh, the standard Boltzmann distribution that we've always seen until now. If we instead block the the, the spins, um, we have that the probability of having a given m for a certain configuration is dependent on the partition function and is exponentially depressed by gi because that gi also contributes to the Hamiltonian. So remember that the Boltzmann distribution is e to the minus beta Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is locked in by the, by the configuration of the spin. We're left with the beta i, which um, in turn um, returns this, this function here. And again, um, here we're not doing anything too brilliant because uh, we're now left with the free energy. And by no, by the, to, to know the free energy, we need to, to know the partition function. But then, and this is, the, um, this is the nice thing of this algorithm, we don't really need to know that free energy, or at least we need just a very rough estimate. And this is because uh, we're again swapping the uh, whole machinery of thermodynamics with the Monte Carlo simulation, um, and we allow the standard Monte Carlo step to be interlaced with a m-changing step. So the way it works, we have a fixed temperature. We run a full sweep of the Monte of the of the uh, Ising lattice. So we um, we try Monte Carlo step on each spin in sequence, and then we propose an m-changing step. Uh, that step will need to be uh, defined in terms of the acceptance probability of the Monte Carlo of the Monte Carlo algorithm. But other than that, uh, the uh, essentially the algorithm here is is complete. And the nice thing about this is that uh, we only need to fix the uh, the last of the beta beta n equal beta tilde, which is our temperature of um, of interest. Uh, this is because um, we want that temperature to be the lowest possible and allow all the other temperatures to be higher for the, uh, for the free energy barrier to be brought down by the, by, by the, by the thermal noise at this higher temperature. Uh, okay. So, um, what is the, the point of this method? The point of this method is that uh, we are able to construct a Markov chain that uh, changes in temperature, but because the temperature change is done properly, the system is always, is always in, in equilibrium with itself, because when we, change the, when we change the temperature, the whole bulk of the, of the, of the lattice has been uh, updated in one go. So there is no um, no sudden change in uh, in temperature in a um, in a in a configuration that is out of equilibrium for the system, um, and um, then there is this there is this uh, consideration about how to choose the the parameter, which um, is 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 interesting, but it's not really necessary uh, that they they write that in the paper. Um, so the the problem with this setting is that um, not not all the beta are weighted equally, because there is that e to the minus g m that depresses some 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 temperature configuration. But we are actually free to choose those g m, and so we can choose g m to be beta m f m, um, which when we plug it back here essentially renders 
this, uh, this, um, this quantity a constant. And so um, all, the, all the beta are at that point equally probable. And we will have uh, a histogram of the visited state in M that will be flat. And at any point, we can stop the simulation and check whether or not the algorithm is, um, is um, in equilibrium or not. Because if we see something that is very far away from, the, from a flat Instagram distribution, um, we know that there is, there is something that is not, that is not going right into the algorithm. Uh, however, and again, they, they write this in the paper, the gain in efficiency by having this, this, this flood distribution is, uh, is, is, is quite limited, and um, it's, often, uh, it's often sufficient to have very rough estimates of the, of the, of the free energy in order to set the GM, uh, the GM parameters in a way that allows the algorithm to, to run smoothly enough. Uh, and finally, they give, um, they give out um, a reasonable um, um, a reasonable way to choose um, the bi and that is kind of a rule of thumb we want the change in temperature to be accepted roughly 50 percent of the time um, because uh, if the values bi is too large then uh, i would jump to a much higher temperature that would bring down the barriers uh, very quickly, but that jump in temperature would be uh, accepted with a um, very low probability, and so my system will be stuck at the same temperature for a long time, which would defy the, the purpose of the algorithm. If the BI is chosen too too small, uh, then the, the the probability of changing the temperature would be much higher, but the um, the temperature increase would not be uh, high enough to overcome the highest, um, the highest energy barriers between uh, the minima that I try to, um, that I'm trying to, to resample. Um, this was the first of the two, um, the, of, of the two contributions that I wanted to talk about. And so I'm now moving to the, to the second one, which is uh, about the, the spin glass. So um, a spin glass uh, is essentially um, um, modified version of an um, of an Ising lattice, and the, the 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 underlying system is really the same in the sense that we have a collection of spin that can either be plus or minus one, at least for the more for the more um, the more known models. Um, but what it changes is what I was mentioning before, is that the the coupling are no longer uh, all of the same sign, and so there is no obvious solution like all the spins pointing up and all the spins pointing down. Um, so um, if we just focus on one, uh, on one couple, on, on one interacting couple of spins, um, we see that a ferromagnetic link um, tends to align them, and an anti-ferromagnetic link tends to anti-align them. Uh, and from now on, we will, we will. Choose the sign of this of this of this interaction to be fixed forever in time. There is also a version of spin glass where they consider um, this coupling to be uh, variable in time, either on the same scale or on a different scale with respect to the spin dynamics. But we won't we won't go into that uh, today. So. Um, this version is called the quench disorder because uh, the, 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 the disorder that is uh, given by the interaction is kind of frozen into the system while the, spin, uh, while the spins interact. And um, one thing that this introduces is uh, the concept of frustration, which is um, it, it, it's very common in complex systems. And um, it's it's the concept for which there is no single optimum, in the sense that there is no um, configuration of the spin that allows us to satisfy all of the interactions simultaneously. So uh, a very simple um, example of this is um, a triangular lattice in which all of the, all of the interactions are antiferromagnetic, so they carry a minus sign. If we start from the top and we're free to assign whatever 
sine 1 to the spin with sine plus 1, then we go down to the, uh, to the, to the bottom right and the link is anti-ferromagnetic, so we want, to, uh, um, we want a different sine with sine minus 1, but then both of them um, seize as a neighbor, as an interacting neighbor, the bottom left one and we either break one connection or the other uh, in assigning that spin. Uh, of course this is a very simple example and this uh, actually goes back to the uh, standard result that there are no, uh, that a graph cannot be bipartite if there is um, an odd length cycle uh, and it's a standard result uh, in graph theory. But then imagine having um, fully interacting lattice um, of, uh, of spin with um, positive and negative interaction, it's far from clear which, the, um, which is the um, optimized uh, vector of spin that, that uh, yields the, the, the minimum of the, of the energy function. This is just another example of uh, frustration. Okay, and um, we are now ready to give out the, the specific model. So spin loss is just a term, a collective term that encompasses all these kind of systems, the, the system of spins with uh, positive and negative uh, interactions. But um, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model is perhaps the simplest of all of them and was around in the 70s. Uh, I think the first um, proposal was in 1975. Um, and has been solved by Giorgio Parisi in 1979 um, with um, um, a really nice trick, if you want, or ansatz. Uh, so, um, I don't have to, sorry. Okay, oh yes, uh, one, uh, one further um, note here is that we, will, we are also considering the simpler version of the, of the spin glass in terms of not having an external field. An external field you can imagine to have uh, an, an external field through the, through the lattice in case of a, of a 2D lattice that um, invites the spin to be aligned with him. So it's something that um, does not depend on the pairwise interactions, but um, and the, the strength of the interaction and the strength of the field are um, and the relative size are essential to um, to determine the behavior of the system. If, uh, of course, in the limit of h going to zero, one would expect that its um, its behavior is negligible, and this is actually the case unless the system is near a phase transition. Because in that case, even the smallest uh, the smallest change can propagate through the system uh, quite quickly and generate new behaviors but we are not considering all of this anyway. So um, what are we considering? Uh, we are considering essentially a very fancyizing model where the uh, interaction couples, instead of having all the same value, positive or negative, are cautionally distributed. And the reason why this, um, this model is so simple and nice is because it is equivalent to its mean field approximation. Because if you think about it, um, I'm putting no, no strain on the sum, so every couple is a neighbor, so the, the underlying graph is fully connected, and the interactions are with zero mean Gaussian. So um, this is exactly the, the setting that you, that you would prepare for a mean field approximation of, of the system. Um, Nevertheless, this being the simplest version of the spin glass, um, the, uh, the proof um, to, of the correctness of the approach that Giorgio Parisi had in 1979 was not proven mathematically uh, until 2001. So it took more than 20 years to um, give a mathematical sound structure to what he introduced. Okay, uh, why is it so difficult? Um, well, you can't sum directly the partition function, we said that before, and the, the, the leading technique is called the replica trick for this, which 
basically allows you to compute the logarithm of the partition function without actually calculating the partition function. And the logarithm of the partition function is what you need to get the, the free energy in the Boltzmann, in the Boltzmann, in the Boltzmann formula. So um, that trick was uh, already flowing around in the 70s, but, um, and we will see, there is no clear parameterization for a certain matrix that is essential to carry out this, um, that computation. So what is the replica trick? The replica trick is usually uh, summed up as follows, um, which uh, it's a very, at least for me, it's a very weird mathematical fact. Um, because that Zn is the partition function of n identical replicas of the system. So you would expect that that number is an integer, and yet you found it, you find it in under a limit for n that goes to zero. So you would expect it to be at least rational, right? Um, so what that limit actually means is that you need as many um, as many data as possible on the natural numbers and then perform the analytical continuation to uh, n0 in order to obtain that, that quantity of the logarithm. What does that mean for the sherrington kirkpatrick model? Um, I, I, I won't go into details, but uh, essentially what you, what you need to calculate that, that limit there is two order parameters. One is a, is a set of matrices and one is a scalar. The set of matrices are the correlation function between two different replicas of the system. So what does what this mean is essentially you create two Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass that are essentially the same, but of course the interaction of random variables. So the disorder will be different in the two in the two systems. And then you let them evolve uh, in time and you, you sample the product of the same spin in both, in both, um, in both simulation, and you perform this average here. This is, of course, already in the Monte Carlo, um, in the Monte Carlo mindset, because what you would need is to perform that average over the Boltzmann distribution. But you can't do that because you don't know the partition function. And we're back again to square one that way. Um, so um, how this propagates into the formalism is, um, is essentially that um, the analytic continuation uh, in the replica trick filters down and reaches this matrix here, Q, I, A, B, uh, and alpha, beta, sorry, um, that uh, needs to be analytically continued to the matrix Q alpha beta at the, on, on the foot size, um, that is what is needed um, in this limit here. So essentially what we have is the Q i alpha beta lives here, and the Q alpha beta without the i lives in this limit here. So essentially you're transporting the analytical con continuation from a function to a matrix. And this is good, but uh, you don't really know how to uh, analytically continue uh, a matrix either. And so what you want to do is to parameterize that matrix to give just a few numbers, or many numbers actually, uh, on which you can actually perform the calculation. And then once you perform the calculation of those numbers, the resulting matrices with the analytically continued numbers will be the analytically continued matrix that will give you the analytically continued function that will give you the partition function. There are some uh, some constraint on that function, which comes from the um, which can be inferred from the uh, mean field theory of the sherrington kirkpatrick model. So essentially, um, or from the physics of the model, really. So, uh, for example, the first one comes from the uh, from the fact that the um, internal energy of the system must be finite. Um, this one here comes from um, a particular symmetry uh, of the system because in the, in the, um, in the 
mean field approximation, you obtain the result by performing a subtle point integration, and you want that subtle point to be symmetric, otherwise you have um, an diverging quantity. And this one here is again uh, due to the energy being, uh, being positive. So here, my question is, with these, with these clues, can you guess the correct parameterization of the matrix? And this is, of course, a, a kind of a rhetorical question because the correct formula of the matrix is this one, which has uh, a, a parameterization that is like three lines long. And this is actually from the original paper. And, and the funny thing is that Parisi admitted straight away that he had no proof that that was the correct, per the correct parameterization. He just said, it's very simple and it works with the simulation. So let's, let's just go with it. Um, this is essentially what he's saying there. And, and, indeed, um, and indeed it worked. Um, and it's very, very complicated to follow how the mathematician uh, actually proven that that yields the correct formula for the, for the sharrington kirkpatrick spin glass. Um, the first step um, is to reformulate the, the problem in another way, uh, which is essentially... Um, so this is the free energy of the sharrington kirkpatrick model, right? We, we said that we weren't going to consider the magnetic field, but that's taken from our famous pentagram, so you just can ignore this, this thing here. But this, this thing remaining here, that's the, the free energy uh, up to some constant. So what is this? Well, this is what you get from that matrix. And you can actually reformulate this in a way that we will see in a moment. And the cool thing about that is that by chance, or maybe not by chance, but like unintentionally for sure, uh, the same method also works on the generalized sharrington kirkpatrick model, which is called the P-spin model, which is essentially the same, uh, except that the, that the interaction are not no longer pairwise, but are P-wise. So these are essentially the, the J's before, uh, except that they are a Gaussian, instead of in one dimension, they are Gaussian in P minus one dimension. And these are just normalizing things for the Hamiltonian to be uh, extensive in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, so, again, what is this that appears there? Well, that is what comes out from the matrix. And you can reformulate that um, as, a purely mathematical, uh, as a purely mathematical theorem because you want to find the infimum of that quantity with respect to any sequence M and any sequence Q that are governed in terms by this first parameter K. So that you need to find the minimum of a quantity that um, depends on a certain number of a certain number of real valued numbers that lies between zero and one. And any sequence of any length can be used there. So you can see this being quite a challenge to prove. And um, Telegram did that in 2001. And this kind of uh, put, a, put a full stop on the whole Sharon Turkey Patrick model because there was um, some, some, some dispute about the, about the, the result from Parisi until that time. And um, what did this result yield in terms of like proper physical result? It's the phase diagram of the SK model. So this is what a statistical model looks like when it's fully solved. You, uh, you, you have the, the parameterization in terms of the strength of the interaction against the thermal noise introduced by the temperature. And we can see that um, some things here are really, are really uh, easy to understand. This is the ferromagnetic phase because the interaction is much stronger than the thermal noise. So 
um, we will reach an optimum, a local optimum, and we will stay there because the temperature cannot flip anything. And so we will have broken links in the Schrenter Kirkpatrick model, but the, we have not uh, enough energy to invert some of the spin and try to move away from that, from that minimum and reach uh, a better minimum. If the temperature, is, if the, 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 the thermal noise is higher than the interaction in the interaction term, uh, well then um, you, you have chaos. You have uh, the, the interaction don't play any role because the temperature can flip a spin whenever it wants. And so having a link that is satisfied or dissatisfied doesn't really play any, uh, any role at all. And then there's the spin last day where, where the, um, both of these two try to compete uh, one against each other, and um, and you have all the complex behavior that um, that I was mentioning before in terms of having a very rough energy landscape with the dynamics that moves from one uh, minimum to the other on a very long time scale. Um, this these two structures here uh, regards. Um, a further development of the theory, which is the replica symmetry breaking. So um, when the replica trick no longer works, um, you have that the ferromagnetic phase uh, is unstable under this line, which is called the Taulis Solmeda. Yes, the Omeda Taulis line. And you have a mixture of states, so we'll have some cluster that behaves like a ferromagnet and some cluster that behaves uh, like a spin glass, and the size of these are uh, exponentially decaying in terms of uh, T minus Tc, which is a critical temperature, but I won't, I won't go uh, in, into depth about that. So this was the, uh, the, second, the second result that I want to show, and now I want to wrap it up very quickly um, with some applications in network science. So how, what can we learn from this? Well. Uh, I have one application explained uh, kind of more in detail for uh, each of the two contributions. And the first one that comes to mind when talking about simulated annealing, simulated tempering, uh, parallel tempering, or really any extension of the Monte Carlo algorithm is the community detection framework in which you try to optimize for, for, for the modularity. And this is very straightforward because you, it, it only needs to, you only need to define what is a Monte Carlo step in terms of community detection, which is often taking one node from one community and trying to swap it into another. And then you can calculate the modularity in the new configuration. And it's up to assign a Hamiltonian, an energy function, and you can accept and reject. And so basically, the simulated tempering technique can be ported straight away once these two steps have been, have been, have been accomplished. And the other one, is in neural networks, especially Hopfield networks, um, which have the nice property of having a Hamiltonian, an energy function that is astonishingly similar to the uh, to the Schrödinger Kirchhoff uh, Hamiltonian, uh, but with a strong difference that the dynamics of the systems is nonlinear because um, the firing of, of the neurons provoke the receiving neurons to fire only after a th certain threshold has been, um, has been achieved. And this comes from the biochemistry of the, of the brain, basically. And this, this small change reflects into the um, phase diagram for the Hopfield model, which, as you can see, is very different from the, from, from the previous one, which was this one. Um, we still have a spingless phase. Uh, we have a critical temperature uh, in a critical line, um, but it's 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 much different. And yeah, I think I'll just go. Um, there are many many other applications: phase transition, interface growing, uh, flocking behavior of flying birds, correlation length in critical fluids, and countless others that. Uh, can be either derived from uh, applications of these two or have been treated in, um, in the academic life of Giorgio Parisi. And 
I will finish here with the references for this presentation, but maybe more importantly, some further reading of some books that are uh, on, the, on the argument, which I always found being really fascinating. Thank you. Can you just say, or if you're online, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and speak it out. Okay. So, just on the face diagram of the Kirkpatrick uh, yeah. spinning glass, uh, what is the spinning glass region? What this, because intuitively you explain the LEQ when it's random noise or when it's uh, basically frozen, and what's the SG? So uh, there, the temperature is strong enough to drive the system away from local minima, but not strong enough that any uh, any swap of the of the of the spin is accepted straight away. So you have this very slow dynamics that goes out of the local minima and falls into uncorrelated minima on very long times. So it's going to look a little bit like locally clustered and evolving. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, you can think of uh, as kind of similar to very clustered networks and a random walk on there. Where, but it's also in very high dimension because you have n, n spins, that, so it's 2 to the n. It's, it's n dimension uh, vector that's evolving, so it's also uh, not clear to, to, to show how, how that is in terms of the energy landscape. Does anyone have any other questions? Otherwise, let's thank Eric again. And Thank you. For